Hey there adventurers, I'm Norwolf and welcome to my role-playing game realm. This is session 18 of my Powers and Perils solo play. So the first thing I want to do is go through the updates to the character sheets. As uh, there's been a couple of sessions since the last time I printed them out. And I've added the experience and uh, expertise points from the last encounter. Let's start with Gildor. So I've highlighted in green the numbers that have changed on, on the front page here. So he's added one point so far in the last uh, two sessions anyways. He's added one point to his dexterity, one point to his agility. His wheel has gone from 42 to 46 and he's added one point to empathy. So that translates to his wake-up chance going up to 44%, his influence chance, which is based on empathy, going up to 56%, his mana level has gone from 13 to 14, and his MDV in, in turn has gone from 16 to 17, and his energy level has gone from 83 to 85. Aside from the magic experience points gains that he's gotten, um, it, he hasn't gone up to MEL 6 yet, or Magic Experience Level 6, but his casting ability has gone up to 70 from 65 because of the mana level change to 14. And the casting ability is basically your MEL times your mana level. Uh, for most typical Magic users. And what else here? Um, that's it for the front page. Actually, that's not completely true. His scimitar skill has, on the original printout was zero. With the use of his scimitar over the last few sessions, he's managed to get it to EL2. And on the skill changes, uh, he's gained various expertise in using the bow. The, oops, I'm not sure why I have the target shield highlighted, but the, the heater shield. His scimitar, he has the expertise that carried over from, from the gains he got before. And of course, he's still working on his horsemanship. As soon as he hits 40 here, he'll get EL0 in horsemanship. And then on the spell side of things, um, one interesting note here is that he is now maxed out his smokeless flame, um, currently, anyways, or for the moment. Uh, he's Gained enough to get to EL4. He was EL3 before. Actually, in the previous printout, he was EL2. So he's used it enough times that it's it's gone up to uh, EL4 since the last printout. Um, but he's hit his max currently. And his max, if we look over here in the actual PDF, it, for a wizard is your intelligence plus your EMEL divided by 10 round down. So his in current intelligence is 43, his EL, MEL is five. Uh, so as soon as he gets, uh, what's that, 48? Uh, as soon as he gets three more points, gets up to, well, two more points, 50 or 51 total, it will be, you'll be able to get up to MEL five. So that was the spell page. So that was really the only change there. Let's go on to the next character. So with Raffin, we have his strength and stamina have both gone from 38 to 42 and 43 respectively. He's added one point to his agility. So in turn, uh, that has bumped up his hit points to 36 from 33. He's 900 experience away from his next combat experience level but he has gained one since the last printout, in which case he's gone to combat experience level seven with an OCV and DCV uh, changing respectively. And his uh, portage ability has gone to 144 from 130, can't tell what it was before, 137, six, something like that. And uh, let's see, I think that's it for this page. 
And then on his skills, he's gained some longbow ex expertise, some bastard sword. And again, I'm not sure why I've got the target shield highlighted here. But his horse art, his heater shield has, has gotten some expertise points in it. And his city survival. Actually, uh, Gilder had some city survival increase as well. That's it for Raffin. For Marizan, 37 on her strength to 40. 36 on her stamina to 40. And she as well has added one point to her agility. So her hit point value has gone to 43 from 41. Uh, that's just her total combat experience points. She's uh, gained one combat experience level since the last printout, so her OCV and DCV have changed respectively. Her healing chance has gone up to 65 from 63. I have a feeling Raffin's healing chance should have changed as well. I didn't catch that. Portage ability 137. Uh, none of her combat, exp combat uh, skills have gone up. And on her skill page, again, uh, a longbow, bastard sword, and heater shield have gained expertise. And her city is already maxed, so any expertise points that she got there would have gone towards combat experience points. So that is it for Mirazan. Want to go to the the other thing I wanted to touch on was the fact that, um, as I mentioned in the previous video, I had been a little bit overzealous on trying to break weapons. I knew something was something didn't quite sit right with me, and I knew there was something wrong there. So uh, last time around, I went and double checked the rules, and sure enough, I had uh, somehow managed to get a little mixed up on that piece. So on page. 93, when we look at the equipment damage. If the damage inflicted is double the fatigue value of a weapon or more, the weapon may break. The chance that it will break is determined by subtracting the fatigue value from the amount of damage scored. The resulting percentage is the chance that the weapon will break. So I was doing that part right. But um, when I had kind of rolled for Marizan's magic sword there. She had only done 31 points of damage with it to the to the orc. And her magic sword had a fatigue value, a current fatigue value of 20. It had one damage on it. So she would have had to do 40 or more points of damage for it to have a chance of breaking. So I'm going to retcon that, and she has her magic sword back in her, in her trusty little hands. So... When last we left our intrepid adventures, Gildor, Raffin, and Marizan had entered the dark, foreboding cave behind the rundown shack. In the first cavernous chamber, they encountered two orchi that seemed to be standing guard and watching both to the north and to the east out of the chamber. They quickly dispatched the two orchi and decided to head northward, um, avoiding the uh, off to the east where they heard the running water and, and could s see off in the in the distance or the darkness uh, what looked like an underground river. Heading northward, it took them into a took them out of the natural kind of caves that must have been carved out by the water into a likely a man-made chamber of some sort where the walls have, had started collapsing in, and what may have been kind of fine craftsmanship at one point uh, was severely aged by just time, or deteriorated by time and the water that's now, you know, soaking the place. I think I forgot to mention last time that there's about a foot of water on the floor. In this chamber, they had seen uh, a number of zombies. Uh, there were two that were beating on the southwest door, Two more that were beating on the northwest door, and uh, another zombie that was close to the northern end of the chamber. They had a quick battle with those zombies as well, and I had just finished them off, and then we had up for the for that session. Choice now is to determine where they 
kind of want to go from from here. They've got the, the two western doors plus one door to the east. And I think just for simplicity's sake, um, they're just going to kind of make their way clockwise around the, the, the doors in this room. So Raffin will head off to this southwest door, closely followed by the other two. And the doors here are basically iron iron doors, but they severely rusted with age. So Raffin, you know, pushes on the door. It doesn't seem to, to budge. And it looks like he's going to have to be, um, force the door open in some, some way. Now, that is a, a skill check of sorts. And pop back to the PDF here. In the problem solving section of book one, uh, page 53, there's a discussion or a the description of how to use your skills, or the, uh, the characteristics and how they, how they can be applied. Typically for, um, and they've got a, a specific section here for battering down doors. And as I said, this is a, a hard metal door. Oops, sorry, it's a rusted metal door. So it has, and in this case, it has a, a resistance of 10. Um, normally it would be a po opposing strength check. So the, the strength of the character doing the battering versus the strength of the door, which is its resistance. Um, I'm going to use the optional rule here where um, basically the has to use the strength to try and beat the, beat the door in for damage to be counted. So it's basically taking this, the character's strength, rolling a d10, dividing his strength by that, by the, the number rolled, and at least 25% of the item's value in damage has to round it up, has to be inflicted before the, the door is actually damaged. So in this case, 25% uh, of 10 is going to be, uh, rounded up is going to be three points. So um, basically it's a, you know, Raffin's strength, which is 42, uh, divided by D10 roll, and that's the amount of damage he does to the door. So let's go back to our camera here, get our handy dice out. So 42 divided by 5, round it up. So that's going to work out to 8 point something, so that'll round up to 9. So he's done 9 points to, of damage to the, on the first hit of the door. It has 1 point left, so it's just barely hanging there on its hinges. And on the second hit, uh, divided by 1, so it's 42 points more. So yeah, that door uh, just absolutely gets beaten right off the, the hinges and, and collapses into the room. Two overlapping doors, it looks like. And having my challenge is opening the second door. Anyways, um, yeah, there we go. Right, so they proceed in. The, again, the room here is caving in. Stones have, that used to uh, hold in the walls have, have fallen in in the northwest north, uh, west corner and started uh, cascading into the room. The, the floor here, again, is covered with roughly a foot of water. The room itself looks like it may have been like a, um, a antechamber or common room of some sort. Hard to tell the any of the furniture that may have been here is is long fallen to decay. Little bits of rusted metal could probably be seen seen in the water as the their light reflects off of it. To the south, they see st steps going up to another door. Part way up the steps, the the water ends. They make their way south into the room. And as they approach the door, they get a, a strange chill up their spines, like there's something not quite right beyond the door. So Raffin cautiously approaches. It's another uh, rusty iron door that seems to be stuck in its frame. So he's again going to uh, beat on the door and, and see if he can open it. So it's uh, his strength of 42 divided by a d10. Well, it's going to be five point something. So another six 
So a total of six damage to the door. It has four more points left. And he's, if there is something on the other side, it definitely knows that they're there. And he takes another run at the door and again does another six points of damage. Raffin beats the door open and before him he sees a dark cold room with the, it looks like it's the, the dilapidated remains of a bedroom chamber. The three of them immediately feel the distinct coldness emanate from the room and a shiver runs up their spine as, as the, the door swings open. You feel the distinct presence of chaos. As they scan the room, a creature appears almost directly in front of them. You see this thing called a Charantes. Charantes. Let me find this guy. So oh, this appear the Carantes appears as a black robed skeletal being whose eyes burn with black fire. An aura of evil power surrounds them. That power and their primar primarily spiritual nature allows them to fly without wings. They have let's see, special abilities. Um these death demons are the common members of the host of abandon. Damage scored by their hands. Uh, hand requires an immediate roll against ML4 EL2 Hand of Death. No armor value or natural armor value applies against it. The aura surrounding them grants EL3 invulnerability to attack, magic or otherwise. And until that defense is overcome, they cannot be harmed, the invulnerability. Uh, so they normally have 13 hit points, so they've got the... Uh, EL3 invulnerability gives them an, uh, a 20 hit point barrier, essentially. So let's get our little dude on the map. Put our pleasant little picture away here. And this guy is basically. So I'm going to write out the character, or write out the monster here, and then we can get into the uh, our battle against this thing. And uh, this thing's definitely not going to be surprised, but it may have ambushed our, our characters here, so I'll do that in a moment as well. So our Garantes here has an OCV3, DCV3, the bracketed CV. So the bracketed ECV is actually described, I think, at the front of the creatures. Let's take a look here. Uh, let's see, DCV, defensive combat value of a creature where parenthetical uh, value occurs unless otherwise specified or otherwise in the description. The unparenthesized value is the creature's defense on land. The other value is in the air if it is a flyer or in the water if it's a swimmer. So this guy is a flyer. So I guess when he's flying, he's got a DCV of six. He is, as I think I mentioned at the start, hovering above the ground. So uh, we'll assume he's flying, so he's working with the DCV of six. Um, and the surprise. <clears throat> so ambush for this guy. Underground, 20%. Uh, he doesn't have any survival eels or anything like that that would modify it. I'm going to give him just a straight 20. These guys felt something coming, uh, so they knew there was something there. Or something bad was, was going to happen. So they are not ambushed. So we will just start with our standard combat phases. All right. Uh, so this thing has a OCV of three. So it's going to be down in the order of nine, equivalent of a sword. So it's going to be going last. I have a feeling that we've got a pretty good chance of taking this guy, taking this thing down before it uh it has a chance to do anything bad to the to the group so uh mana allocation uh gilder can't even see him really at this point uh oh i guess he does see him he could, up the stairs could probably see the things upper half or head uh floating as he as he floats above the ground um 
just gonna have these guys move in. The Raffin will head in here. If he tries to get a flank on this guy or to get her towards the rear, it, the, I'm sure the this creature's smart enough to to back up and not allow itself to get a get uh, attacked from opposite sides. Um, we're gonna assume that all these guys basically rush up and and attack, and it will have uh, maneuvered itself so that they couldn't uh, get flanks on it or uh, rear attacks. So let's start with. Let's see, combat orders are uh, attack priority for Gildor with the scimitar is a five. Raffin with his that's magic scimitar with his magic bastard sword is a five, and Mirazan with her newly returned magic broadsword is a four. So she's going first, and then we'll do Raffin and then Gildor. So we have her. OCV 10 versus DCV 6, so she's on the plus 4 line. She is subtracting with the multiple people attacking. She's subtracting 5 for the multiple attackers, 6 for the magic sword, and 7 for the EL of the, in her uh, broadsword skill. For a total of 18. 7. That is going to be a deadly hit. So, uh, not that I'm happy about that. Because that's just going to damage her sword some more. Um, 3d10 plus 11. So she is doing 1526. So that 26 is enough to take out the vulnerability. <clears throat> This thing has no natural armor value, so the other six goes against the actual creature. So this is Mirazan with the rod sword. We have uh, seven hit points left, and it goes it at, it dies at minus two, and it fights till it's dead with the the asterisk beside the de the uh, damage tolerance value. So we have Rathen, who's Swinging at this thing. He's got EL7 in his bastard sword, four from the uh, magic weapon, and so he's subtracting 16. Oh, three on the plus, well, he's got an OCV11 on the plus five line. And on the plus five line, that is going to be a severe hit which is probably going to be enough to finish this thing off. Uh, so he is doing a d10 plus 9. Yep, that's going to do it. Nine, well, minimum damage is 10, and he only has 9 left, so... Um, yeah. Oh, speaking of which... I need to give Mirazan another damage on her sword. 1. Raffin. Did a what did I say? Uh, eighteen. E ten plus nine, eighteen. That's going to be another minus one there. No chance of breaking. It's not double his fatigue value. And uh, that finishes off the last nine hit points. Oops. And that's uh, Raffin with his bastard sword. And. Gildar actually gets to be able to swing, and he will, because he'll be able to also get that nine last nine hit points should he hit. So he is subtracting heal two, so eight and five, 13 from his roll. And that's probably going to be a miss. He's on the plus one line. And a plus one is, yeah, that's total miss. So nothing for him. So this thing screeches, it falls to the ground and, and just and the bones and, and, and uh, fabric of, of his hooded cloak just kind of disintegrate as it, as it falls. So, um, 
What do we have? We have a thing that has a combat difficulty factor of four. So they all get um, one expertise in their shield. Uh, Marizan will get eight expertise with her broadsword. And she did a total of six points of damage. So she gets 48 combat experience points and one characteristic. Raffin will get eight expertise with his bastard sword. He did a total of nine points of damage. So what's that? Uh, 56 combat experience points for one characteristics. He would have needed to do 60 to get two characteristics. No, 54. What are we talking about? And, uh, yeah, that's it. So let me quickly update the character sheets and we will get back to our crawling here. All right, so what I've done is Marizan's getting 54 combat experience points. He is adding one point to her. Uh, she'll add it to her. Actually, uh, you know what? She'll add it just for difference. She will add it to her intelligence. And, of course, eight to her broadsword and one to her heater shield. It didn't get hit, but it was used during her combat. What, what little of combat there was. Raffin is getting 48 combat experience points. He's adding one to his agility. And uh, looking at this, he should probably get his agility up to 31 so we can get that extra agility bonus. And of course, he also got his eight to his bastard sword and one to his heater shield and nothing for Gildor. Guy is done. And let's see. So they do check out the room. And in the, within the room, in one corner, off to one side of the room, they find a small, small chest uh, or a small uh, um, little uh, jewelry case or something like that that's on the floor beside some old erect piece of furniture. And within it, they find uh, 68 silver coins, as well as a nearly flawless, fine clarity, medium-sized tourmaline, tourmaline gem that uh, they estimate is worth 21 silver coins. And there's also a talisman in there, and Gilder can tell right away that it's magical. Um, he'll need to spend a little bit of time with it and determine what it is. But just for the sake of me not me remembering for later, uh, it is a talisman of immunity to poison at MEL8, EL4. Uh, it's a pendant uh, in, of uh, intricately woven from silver and shaped in a, like a coiled serp serpent. Its eyes are set with tiny emeralds that gleam with mystical light, symbolizing its power to ward off all forms of poison. And there's a metal heater shield in there, but it's rusty beyond use. Let me get rid of this creature here. A little purple stain on the ground where it was. And our characters end up backtracking towards the direction they came as they don't see any, any other exits from this room. So next, I guess they go back to the room where they fought the skeletons and head to the northwest door. Again, Raffin's going to need to beat on the door. They splash their way through the water. All right, so that's uh, again 10, 10 hit point door. Biting his 42 strength by a die 10 roll. 
go three. Um, well, that's gonna, he's gonna be able to break the door just on the first hit. So the door flings open. And beyond, he sees another room with a water covered floor. Looks like some sort of an antechamber or something. The walls to the south are caved in, so the room may have been larger at one point. They'll make their way deeper into the room. They see a door on the north wall, and it looks like the passage, there may be a passage heading south. I think we're going to ignore the door for the moment and take a look down the south passage. And again, there's kind of an eerie coldness that seems to be uh, emanating within within the room itself. Kind of leaves these our our, our uh, illustrious characters here feeling a little uh, a little nervous. I mean, the the last encounter wasn't so bad. They managed to get the drop on it essentially, but uh, they'll head around the corner. And they see that the, the, this chamber here is, you know, maybe a third collapsed in. The water on the floor is icy cold. And they continue to make their way into the, uh, into the darkness here. Raffin leading. As they approach this opening here where there, there was likely a door once, but it's its rusted remains are, are somewhere on the ground here. They hear an eerie wail come from the room beyond. And the air suddenly gets very cold as they, uh, as they approach. And they've, they've felt this once before. They've, they know that uh, the last time they fought whites, the, the air got icy cold. And uh, sure enough, there is a, a white in, this, in the chamber ahead. What they see though is a little bit more um a little bit more uh hideous or a little more a little more scary than the last time they saw it this one actually seems to be wearing armor but before them they see that familiar looking white like character like creature and this one has a its hand attack or its, it's a physical attack is like a great sword but inflicts a burning touch only magical healing can, can heal the any damage inflicted by it. The wound never heals normally or naturally. Uh, and of course, the whites, uh, the corporate demu generates an MEL6 EL2 cold around it, which, if I remember correctly, was 30 feet. So our characters are essentially within the range of this thing when it when it appears. Yeah, 30 feet exactly to him. So uh, I'm just going to roll for all these guys. Because uh, they'll, be, they'll be getting up there right away anyways. So. All right, so this works by... Um, it's an ML6 cell like ability. So it's going to be on the 6 line. And we are rolling... Uh, one roll for the group or against the group, and then I apply each of their different uh, magic defensive values against that roll separately. So an 80 is not going to be effective, regardless of what the MDV is. So it's going to be 80 minus the EL2 times 2, so that's going to be minus 4, but then we're adding back um, 17 for Gildor, we're adding separately 3 for Raffin, and 5 for Marizan. But as I said, he, I would have had to roll uh, 52 or, or less, probably 51 or less, or would potentially affect, uh, actually 53 or less, before it would affect Raffin, who's got the lowest MDV. But knowing that these things have, or that this guy is wearing armor, it's going to be significantly more difficult to damage him because he's, al he's already got a natural armor value of natural armor value of six and he is wearing scale mail 
Oh, actually, he's wearing plate mail. Well, well, that's going to be another armor value of four on top. This could be an interesting battle. Let me write up the creature on the sheet here, and then we'll get into the first phase. So as I was writing this up, the one thing I just noticed in the write-up that I did on this guy some time back is that he's actually carrying a magic axe. So I think he's going to... Although the burning touch is uh, an interesting thing, I think he's going to use his magic axe. It's an ML10 EL5 um, enchanted axe. So it has a fatigue value of 20 instead of, I think, 9 is the normal. And it has plus 6% to hit, so he's subtracting 6 from his roll when he's using it, which is better than his natural weapon index of 0. And it has a weapon strength bonus of plus 4. He's got a strength bonus of plus two, so he's he's doing plus six damage with it instead of just plus two damage. Um, so that, and I think just from being a, a, a warrior in his former life, apparently uh, wearing his plate mail. Uh, does he have a shield? No, he doesn't have a shield. So I guess that's one saving grace. Um, no shield. And no helm. Must have lost that somewhere in his in his uh, in his death. Uh, yeah. So let's see where this takes us. Well, that magic axe is going to have a normally an axe is the same speed as a best sword, broadsword, or heavy sword general. The axe is going to have an order of seven, but that's modified by the magic. Magic weapons. Uh, the attack priority of a magic weapon equals the order listed, which is seven, for the weapon minus the EL divided by two roundup. So EL five divided by two be uh, 2.5 so three so he's gonna have a speed of four called an attack priority which means Raffin goes then he goes and then our other two fellows or our other two guys go or sorry Marzan goes first with with her four as well So, uh, I'm assuming these guys would have gotten a bit closer before this combat actually happened, so as they were affected by the cold, or not affected, essentially. And we get into phase one. And, uh, you know, all of one whole phase here. Uh, so here, phase... I have a feeling this should last at least a few phases. So starting with Mirazan and her speed of four. Her weapon attack priority of four. She is OCV 10. Oh, well, actually, let's get our movement done here. Uh, they will move up partway. This thing is going to be moving up to meet them. And Gildor, I guess, is not a... I guess, you know what? Gildor's going to attempt a spell on this thing. Uh, MDV 12. I mean, if he succeeds, that's a, a boatload of experience. And he will be using... Well, he's he's moved this round, so he's not casting. We're doing no uh, no uh, missile fire. Although I guess Gilder could have shot a missile this round. So yeah, let's say that uh, Gilder fired off his bow. He would have done it from probably twenty-ish feet away or so, and he's looking for point blank range basically. He's going to be on the plus 11 line. He is subtracting 
one. You've only got an EL1 in that. A 19 on the plus 11 line. Or 17, no. Oh, sorry, magic bow. So we're subtracting 6 for the magic bow and 1 for the EL, so minus 7. That's going to be 12. And that's going to be a severe hit. Which is probably what he needs to do before he can actually damage this thing, because he's going to be subtracting 10 points from his from the damage. So D10 plus 4. 12. So we get 2 points of damage get through. Alright, now we get into melee and whatnot. So that would have been... Uh, probably from there. 5, 10, 15, 20. Yeah, so that would have been from there. So, let's start with Marizan. Marizan has minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, so minus 18 to her roll. Probably remember that from last time. And she is on the DCV of 5, so she's on the plus 5 line. And 80, 70, 60 something on the plus 5 line is going to be a miss. Uh, Raffin is on the plus 6 line with a minus uh, 11, 16. So it's going to be 40. The plus 6 line is going to be a shield hit, so no shield. He has, he has a slight chance of doing one point of damage to this guy with his d6 plus 5. Where's my d6? There it is. Well, there, look at that. One point of damage. Gets through. Raffin with Mustard Sword. Three. As I said, we're nickel and diming this guy. Oh, sorry. Before, well, I'm going to leave Raffin's attack, but this thing swung back at... Uh, one, two, three, Marizan, four, five, six, Raffin. So it's, he's attacking Marizan with the magic axe. He is OCV 10 versus her DCV 10, so that's on the zero line. He's subtracting her shield skill plus the size of the shield, so we're subtracting six from his roll, which is negating the plus six to hit. Uh, no EL, so it's basically a straight percentile roll on the zero line. 72 is going to be a miss. Needed a 50. And yeah, then Raffin went, and he did all one point of damage to it, and Gilder had shot. So we are on to phase two. Right, what does Gilder want to do for a spell? Um, I think if he wants to be, he wants to get the biggest bang for his buck. He's got an EL4 in his, in his, uh, smokeless flame. Uh, so that'll be subtracting, um, the EL, oh shit, EL times two? EL? Or is it just the EL? Verify that, I've been playing too many other games recently. And some of these rules end up slipping out of the old noggin. Uh, magic table. Subtract EL times 2 from the roll, add the target's MDV. So, yeah, he's going to use his language, or attempt to use his language. And the language is number 2, which is Tongue of the Giant. So he has a 60% chance of using his language successfully. 14 does it, so he's got an effective EL of 5 now. He gathers 5 mana per phase. And let's see, uh, base mana costs 4. Base mana costs 4. He can gather, he can, essentially in two phases, he can get, and with the, having used the supernatural language, it's reducing the casting cost by 20% round down. So if he was to cast it at EL1, he 
it would cost him five, he'd get it off in one phase. If he cast it at EL2, it would take the two phases and cost him seven. If he cast it at EL3, it still takes him two phases and costs him eight. And if he casts it at EL4, again two phases and, and costs him ten. So I think he's going to go for the big bang here. He's going to try for, going to gather mana for the two phases. Cast it at, oh, hang on, EL, oh yeah, piece of mana costs four. It would take three phases to cast it at EL5, so he's going to go for the two. So he's gathering five mana this phase. And that was his bit. Nobody's doing missile fire. Mirazan is swinging at this guy. Minus 18 to her roll on the plus 5 line. 65, that's probably going to be at least a, a shield hit or a hit or something like that. He needs a 50 or a 60 something. Yeah, so that's going to be a, just a regular hit. And she is doing a d6 plus 6. So again, he needs to roll high. So she's 11 points, 10 of which get blocked. So she's done one point of damage. And this thing now swings at, I'm going to say again, one to three her, four, five, six, Raffin. No, oh, staying on her. On the zero line, no modifiers. 49 is going to be a shield hit. So it is doing uh, d6 plus 6 to her shield. And that's 11 points. I have a feeling that's enough to damage her shield. So it's not greater than 14, but it is greater than half, so 1 point of damage to her shield. Now Raffin swings and then Gildar. Oh no, not Gildar. Raffin swings. Gildar is casting mana. Raffin is on minus. He's on the plus six line and he is subtracting 16. So that's 23. 23 on the plus six line is going to be a regular hit. He's doing a die six plus. Die six plus five. It bounces completely, no damage. And that is it for phase two. Phase three. Mana allocation. Raffin, or sorry, Raffin, Gildor gets his last five mana points. And no missile fire during the magic effect phase. He is going to try and see if his spell affects this thing. It has an MDV of 12. He's subtracting 10. So it's plus 2 on the 5 line. I think he's only, uh, he's ML5. Twenty two plus 2, 24. Well, that's a success. MEL4 Smokeless Flame. Oops, wrong book. Book 2. You'd think I know this spell by now. I use it so often. These, oh, Smokeless Flame. There it is. Range. He had a range of 50 feet. Uh, does 3d10 plus 16 or yield at cast at EL4 so times 4 16 so 3d10 plus 16 so he has a chance of actually killing this thing so that's going to be 15 31 and that is going to be enough to take out the rest of this So our white is dead, and Gilder's got a good chunk of experience from that.
So, um, starting with Gildor. Gildor hit it with a bow, two points of damage, and it has a combat difficulty factor of seven, so he gets 14 combat experience points and two times the MDB, or sorry, two times the uh, CDF, uh, 14 um, expertise with his bow. Marizan. Hit it with broadsword, so 14, uh, or, well, 14 expertise with the broadsword, 14 expertise with the bastard sword. They each did one point of damage, which is kind of scary, so seven combat experience points, and no characteristics. Um, 14 combat experience points gives him one characteristic. Now, for the magic. Uh, magic gains. He gets uh, the MDV at the target times two expertise. So he gets, um, he would have gotten 24 expertise points in Hopeless Flame, but it's maxed. So that 24 expertise becomes experience points. Magic experience points, so plus 24. And, put that again. And for magic experience, he's getting the MDV times the EL plus 2. So the EL was 4, 6. 6 times the MDV. That's going to be 72. Right? Yeah, that's right. 72. So that's going to be uh, four characteristics. So it's per 25 with no minimum. That's paired quite well in this battle, that's for sure. And uh, he can put, so the characteristics for magic uh, gain can't go against strength or agility. And the one characteristic from his combat can go against anything. So he will probably add that to his agility just because the only way he'll get it up is through his through his uh, combat. And the four characteristics from the magic, he's probably going to put... Ooh, well there's an interesting... So his... Max is based on hinging on his intelligence. So I think he's going to add two of the four points to his intelligence. That's going to be 45. And that might actually be enough to bump up his uh, max EL level here. Or, no. Yeah, maybe not. He might need one more point. Uh, I can't remember what I said earlier. And... The other two characteristics he will throw into uh, he's gonna throw into let's put it in will forty eight and then I'll add in the rest of the experience points and everything else for these guys after the fact uh they will spend some time searching through the room. And as I said, this looks like a, like it may have been, actually, I don't think I described this room all that much, but uh, this room looks like it may have once been a bedroom as well. Uh, the water covers the floor in this room. Any furnishings have long since kind of rotted away in the water. Uh, the walls are, are crumbling in. Oops. Uh... In the room, there's stuff scattered all over the place. So they end up spending a bit of time scrounging through the room. Let's get rid of our little white character here. And what do they find? So aside from the plate mail that the white was wearing, which was still in good condition, well, maybe a little rusty, but it can be cleaned up. And uh, they found a battle axe 
in the room, a composite bow in the room, the magic axe. If scattered around the room or on the floor, hence the uh, digging around in the water, they found 81 gold coins and a set of scale mail that was on a rack that had fallen onto some rocks over here. Uh, there was a halberd that was leaning up against the wall, the magic axe that he was using, a uh, copper drinking horn worth two copper coins, the composite bow, actually the composite bow was in the water and it's ruined, and they find two gems and a, and a jewel. First gem is a small, flawless, fine clarity diamond worth 45 silver coins. Next one is a small, minimum flaws, fine clarity lapis lazuli for 8 silver coins. And the jewel is a small, nearly flawless, brilliant star form sapphire worth 66 silver coins. So they've uh, found a good chunk of val uh, valuables so far in this place. So I think I'm going to pack it up here, and in the next session they will continue trudging their way through this underground complex, looking for whatever that uh, chaos artifact was that the wizard uh, that they killed was sent here to find. I think they want to make sure that they can find that and take it out of out of circulation. Uh, if they leave, uh, I'm sure that you know. Um, uh, I can't remember the, the guy's name that sent the wizard here, Chiral or something like that, would probably send uh, another group looking for for the item. It seems to be fairly important to him. But uh, yeah, so we will uh, catch you later. Thanks for joining me, everyone. Have a great day.